Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Google Hangout for Startup CEO. I'm Rusty Dornan with the Kaufman Fellows Academy, and I'm very honored to have on hand today Eric Ball, who is the Senior Vice President of Finance for Oracle. He also has another title, which I happen to love, the treasurer of Oracle, because it always sounds like he's got a crystal ball out there and is looking out to figure out all the financial futures. Uh, Eric is a Kaufman Fellow. He's uh, also an instructor for KFA and has written a book, co-authored a book with uh, his colleague Joe LaPuma called Mini MBA Unlocking the Ivory Tower, and we'll be talking about that a little later. Uh, that is a class that's going to be coming up on KFA. So Eric, let's go ahead and just dive in. As you know, many of the folks here are looking at ways to finance their startup in, in the really early stages. Um, according to the Kaufman Foundation for a study, half of the startups are self-funded. What's really the best way for startups to make that happen? Well, um, uh, well, first let me say thanks for uh, thanks for inviting me to be here. It's uh, it's really fun to do the Google Hangout with uh, with everybody in the startup CEO course here at Kaufman Fellows Academy. Um, and you know, I think that uh, a lot of startups are self-funded because that's the easiest form of funding is your own money. Um, it, it's easier to spend your own money than convince somebody else to invest in you. And particularly when you're very early on, um, you're often forced to to fund yourself early on while you're identifying what the uh, business proposition is that you would want. Um, a more formal angel investor or venture capitalist uh, to participate in. In terms of the best way to self-fund, you know, I, I'd say the, the, the easiest way, if you, if you can pull it off in a perfect world, is to build a business that brings in revenue very quickly because the, the best source of funding is your customers. And if you can um, get out uh, an early product that will actually that people will actually pay for, um, then you you can move quickly from your own savings, which may be minimal, uh, to spending your revenues, which which works much much better. Um, and different businesses have varying levels of ability to bring in revenue early on. But what I would encourage people to think about is, um, you know, you may from a financial standpoint, you may not want to wait till your product is perfect. Um, you may want to put out an earlier imperfect version of the product, bring in some revenue, and then can continue to improve the product uh, so that you can bring in more revenue later. Um, the, the other element of self-funding, and it really applies to any form of funding, is to, um, is to minimize your expenses. Uh, can you borrow an office instead of paying for an office? Um, can uh, can you use your own savings? Can you pay early employees with stock instead of cash? Um, funding at any level, including self-funding, really starts with expense management and and kind of being ruthless about uh, calling any expense that can happen later. Uh, do it later. Don't don't incur it now. I, I do want to say I know people are beginning to join us that uh, hopefully the question uh, uh, our, our question angle is working here so if you do have questions for Eric Ball uh, the treasurer at Oracle about financing early stage startups please do ask the questions we'd love to be taking some questions for you um, of course you know initially as we're talking about trying to either bootstrap uh, you know doing it on your credit cards or out of your own bank account many people end up borrowing money from family and friends. That's the kind of thing you turn to first, right? Uh, what do you see the pros and cons of doing that initially? I mean, is it better to try to just raid your own equity and your own bank load and, and, and loan and, tr and refrain from going to family and friends or, or you know, what are the pros there? Well, I, I think both the pros and the cons stem from the same source, which is that your family and friends are not professionals. They're not professional investors. Now that's good in the sense that um, you know they they they're more emotionally interested in helping you, and um, and they may be less concerned with the cold-eyed uh, prospects for your business than in supporting you and and helping you. So they may be more likely to give you money when you're unproven in your very early stage, and, and that's a definite advantage. Um, but the fact that, that your family and friends are not professionals works as a disadvantage as well in that it's not just business uh, to them. Uh, they may not 
have this attitude, well, I'm going to fund 10 companies like this, and if one makes it, I'm okay. Um, they may be genuinely surprised uh, if the business doesn't pan out. Uh, they may not understand the risk that they're taking, and, 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 and it may affect them personally. So you have to say, if I'm unable to pay my, my uncle or, or my college friend back, will it affect the relationship that you have with that person? Because for them, it's not just business. It is personal. And that, and that works as an advantage, and it works as a disadvantage. And you have to assess yourself, um, you know, how, how that pans out on net. But you really just need to be aware that, uh, that, that they're not going to think of it in necessarily the same terms that a professional angel investor or, or venture capitalist might, might think of it. Um, and, and they're certainly not doing it um, as part of a portfolio. They're doing it because they want to help you. Great. And we have a question from David Kasem. If you have a bootstrap startup that's growing and puts out excess cash, when is the right time to raise money from investors? I mean, is there a, a time you can really determine, okay, now's the time? Well, it, it depends on how much excess cash you have. Um, you know, if you're throwing off enough excess cash to grow, you may not need investors. And it's not a given that you have to have investors. Um, if if you can uh, self-fund, um, you may decide that you don't want to suffer the equity dilution that comes with having investors. Now, there, there are exceptions to that. Um, some investors bring expertise. Um, some venture capitalists don't just give you capital. They give you expertise. They give you uh, their network. They give you a seal of approval that says that you're a serious, incredible business because you know, if, if a, a name brand venture capital firm invests in you, you may be unknown, but they're known and you're borrowing their name brand and you're borrowing their expertise. So um, to what extent do you have expertise in the business that you're, you're, you're doing and to what extent might you need help getting new expertise? That's one element. Even if you don't need the expertise or if you have it anyway, um, the question, if you're generating excess cash, that may allow you to grow at some pace. The question becomes, at what point do you want to grow at a pace that can't be, that can't be achieved without um, external funding? Uh, and, and, you know, you, you don't want to be self-funded and grow at 5% when, uh, when if you really got serious about uh, spending some money, you could grow at 100%. And so you have to think about what the growth prospects are if you had more capital, compare it to the growth prospects of just using your excess cash. Um, and I'd always say that you need more cash than you think. Um, and and what, I, what I would leave this question with is um, even if you have cash, um, you can run through cash and it can take longer to complete a financing round than you project it will. Um, so you always want to err on the side of raising money too soon rather than too late because if you run out of cash, it's game over. Um, you know, that's a type 2 error you can't recover from, whereas if you raise cash a little bit early or a little bit too much, um, that's a, a much milder error that's, uh, that's very recoverable. And uh, you, you can also faster growth and more market share, especially where the competition uh, maybe catching up and gives you more opportunities. Um, also, well, yeah, I think you need to see where your competition is, and not um, if you self-fund, you're constrained by your own level of cash, and maybe your competition doesn't suffer from that constraint. So, looking around at who else is in your space is is an important uh, addition to that. Right, and as uh, I, I think Matt points out in the book, in a startup, if you invest in into new hires and more product features, you you end up fueling growth. But if you cut costs and halt new initiatives, you will put money in the bank. How do you decide which approach to use? Do you you know fuel your growth, or do you put money in the bank uh, as you're growing? Uh, you know, and, and what is more attractive to acquirers if you're even looking to get acquired? Well, I mean, the answer is yes. Uh, you you want to fuel growth and you want to put money in the bank. Um, I, I would say that early stage, um, to the extent that you're generating cash, there's no reason not to redeploy that cash into the business. That That's not usually a hard decision to, to invest your own uh, cash back into the business. What's a harder decision is, 
are you going to go raise external financing, dilute your equity position, uh, take a little bit more financial risk in order to meet your growth milestones faster? And that's there is a, it isn't a formulaic answer. It's as much art as science, um, and, and it depends on your situation on what the benefit of growing fast is. But I think in many cases, if you're if you're successful enough that you're already growing, and if you validated the concept, then you should be able to raise external financing on reasonably attractive terms. And, and I think some entrepreneurs. Are, are too reluctant to raise that external financing because they don't want to dilute their their position, and and I'd say you know it's better to own half of a large company than three quarters of a small company, um, and if you can get uh, if you can get the financing and if that's going to let you reach your growth milestones faster, um, it, it's certainly something you should you should consider. And we are taking questions, so anybody who has questions for Eric Ball, uh, treasurer at Oracle, about early stage startups and ensuring the flow of capital, please do submit those questions. We've talked about family and friends. You know, now let's talk about that that next thing that people tend to go to, and that's angels and venture capitalists. If uh, you are in the early stages, which would you recommend? I mean, how risky is uh, going into it, getting venture debt for early stage entrepreneurs? Well, so there, there, there are a few categories there. There's, there's venture debt, there's angels, and there are venture capitalists. And, and each of the three kind of brings their own set of advantages and disadvantages. Venture debt sounds good because why would you dilute your equity if you could borrow the money and just pay an interest rate? Um, but, but I think it, it often doesn't work out as well as it sounds because uh, venture debt can be hard to get. Um, and it can involve pretty high interest rates. It can involve warrants um, where the debt converts to equity under certain circumstances. And it can involve constraints where, you know, in order to do something interesting, now your lender has to sign off on it. And what is often the case when you borrow money in venture debt is you need the, the constraint around needing the lender's participation kicks in right when something challenging is happening. As long as things are going well, uh, you, you may be in good shape, but when something challenging happens, that's when all of a sudden the lender has a say in the matter. And so you have to think about um, in the very circumstance where you might need the most flexibility is where your flexibility would be constrained. So venture debt can play a real role, but I would never count on it as being you know, I, either there when you need it or, or not having some gotchas. Um, you know, when you're uh, when you're facing a challenge and can least uh, deal with the gotchas. Between angel investors and um, and venture investors, angels are kind of halfway between family and friends and venture capitalists. Uh, some of them are very knowledgeable, um, but some of them aren't. Some of them are wealthy individuals who want to dabble in different businesses, um, and you really have to evaluate the expertise and and the motivation behind an angel investor. Uh, some of them want to coach young startups. If you're a young startup and you want to be coached, that's great. But if, if, if you're going to be getting advice that you may not want or need uh, from somebody who's invested in you, that may be less appealing to you. I'd say angel investors are probably more professional than your family and friends. But, but arguably less professional than a venture capitalist who's going to do a little bit more due diligence and, uh, and have a little bit more of a rational, cold-eyed approach on, on the prospects for your business. Okay, we have a, another question from a student, Marcel Awasam. What would be your advice to a startup where all, the only two co-founders have completely different views in moving forward? One wants to continue bootstrapping, but the other wants to go for angel investors, and the concept is not yet validated. Um, well, you know that's it. It depends on uh, it, it depends on you know that's one example of a conflict that two co-founders could have uh, all along the, the the process, and and that conflicts in vision or decisions can happen in the financing realm or in any realm, and and that's why it can be a little bit of a challenge to have equal co-founders. Um, you find a lot of businesses end up with uh, one co-founder who's a little more equal than the other 
And in fact, sometimes venture capitalists, uh, I believe, insist on um, clarifying, you know, who breaks a tie um, when, when there's that kind of, of conflict. Now, in, in, in the context of this particular question about do you bootstrap or do you get angel investing, um, y you can, you can uh, go down the path. You can evaluate angels. You can talk to angels, see what they're offering, see what their expertise is and their motivation. Do they have a, a particular skill set that could be useful to the company? Um, are they going to meddle and, and make yet a third decision maker or a third source of indecision? Or, or are they going to help actually clarify decisions? Um, that, that'll become obvious as you evaluate different angel investors is what do they bring to the table? And that may make the decision easier uh, you know, for the two people to reach agreement. Um, but, but fundamentally, I think that when you have two co-founders, it always sounds great early on to say we're, we're co-partners, we're 50-50. Uh, I think that this is one of several examples where you may ultimately decide that, uh, that one person needs to break a tie and, and that ultimately there has to be one decision maker. And, and also, Eric, can't there sometimes be a drawback with angels in the fact that it's, it takes sometimes a long time to corral them and to get them to actually invest the money? Right. It, it, it can take a long time. That's why I say there's no harm in starting the discussion because it's going to take a while anyway. And then as you, as you move from the thought of angel investors to, you know, it's actually going to be this, you know, John Smith, angel investor, and, and, and he brings, you know, this expertise to the table, but he's going he's gonna to meddle in your decisions as well or not. Um, it's, easier, it's easier to compare self-funding to a specific angel investor than it is to, say, angel investors in general, and it is going to take a while. And in the meantime, you're, you're stuck with self-funding while, while you're uh, waiting through that decision process. Uh, we want to go through a couple more student questions here for uh, Dimitri Chiron. Uh, what resources do you suggest for co-founders who came from engineering backgrounds and have no previous financial education? Well, it's always good to train yourself, um, but it's even better to hire somebody who already knows what they're doing. Um, uh, so as early, as early in the process as possible, I would say, you know, hire uh, either hire a CFO or even an accountant, uh, it, depending on the stage of the business. There are a lot of um, part-time accountants who might be, who might do the books for five different startups, and, and they act as consultants, and they can give you uh, a financial brain that's looking at the business. But regardless of who you hire, you have to know um, what's going on with the cash in your business. And, and I would I would tell anybody um, that. Don't view finance as somebody to prepare the financial statements. It, you know, regardless of who's preparing it, um, the CEO really needs to understand the statements as well as the CFO or the accountant. In particular, the cash flow. Um, some people look at the um, the income statement, and and they don't pay enough attention to the cash flow. You may be signing up contracts with big customers and showing revenue on your income statement. But until those customers pay you, um, it doesn't matter. Um, and and you, your accounting statements can show a great profit, but if, if you have a big customer that either doesn't like your product or they've run into hard times and they're conserving on money by delaying payments to vendors, you, you can hit the wall regardless of what your income statement says. So you really need to learn to focus on the bank statement and, and the cash flow and just how much cash do you have in the bank and what cash is going out and coming in. And that's more important than, than whether your P&L says a positive or a negative number. And, and it's good to hire people to help you with that, but you, you've got to at least understand the cash ins and outs yourself. Okay, great. Uh, we have another one from Mariah Lichtenstern. Can you speak to best practices for creative financial projections for startups, reasonable sources of metrics to project growth? Also, can you speak to when it's appropriate to recruit talent in the finance department? Who would you hire first to work? That's a really good question, um, and, and I, uh, I'm not sure I have a great answer to the first part of that question, which is what, what metrics would I, what, would I uh, 
suggest or you know creative financial projections. Um, I don't know the financial projections have to be all that creative. They just have to be organized and, and disciplined. And you, you don't want to be or appear too creative because uh, you want to put your best foot forward. But obviously, anybody who's looking to invest money in your company isn't going to expect that your, uh, your projections are perfect or they're going to be accurate. What they want to see is that you've thought about the drivers of uh, what's going to make your business profitable or not and that you're thinking clearly about how you're managing revenues, how you're managing expenses, what are your margins going to be, what's a realistic growth path for how many customers can you bring on in, in a quarter. Um, they, they, they just want a sense that you're thinking about it in a rational and realistic way and that you don't assume that you can quadruple in size every quarter if you don't have the staff to execute on delivering to customers and, and and the specifics are going to depend on your business if you're selling software you write it once and and, and you sell it a million times you're only constrained by by the sales you know your execution becomes telling people about your software but actually delivering it may be trivial uh, if you're in another type of business execution goes beyond sales where now in order to onboard a new customer you may need engineers to actually do something with each customer that's going to limit your ability to scale or constrain it regardless of how much the market likes your product so you have to think of all of that while you're doing financial projections but I don't think you need to get particularly creative you just need to build a spreadsheet that goes several quarters out in the future and show that you're thinking through what drives revenue for your business what drives expense for your business and, and and make it clear that you've you've thought it through in terms of specific metrics I think it's going to be different for different businesses I think it's going to depend on whether you're in a business that's creating you know software that's more scalable or a service or a product um, and and you should look at what metrics other people in that sector tend to use and take those as suggestions it's also an example where having an investor with a specific expertise in a sector can help you because y you can ask them what what metrics should we be focused on for this sector y you can admit that you're that, that you're looking for education on things like metrics in terms of recruiting for the finance function the second part of that uh, of that good question um, I, I mean first you need need somebody who who can just you know keep the books? You need you, you need an income statement, a balance sheet, and a statement of cash flows. And if you don't know how to do that, your your first priority is getting somebody who knows how to do that. Uh, I think your second priority is getting somebody who can build a spreadsheet and forecast those statements forward. Depend you know knowing or understanding what the drivers are for your particular business, and who can think through and and forecast that. And then I think the rest of the financial recruiting sort of falls out. It'll, I think it will become clear what you need, but uh, but the base accounting and what I'll call financial planning uh, are are likely to to be the places where most people start. Okay, we have another question from uh, David Kasem again. How do you determine an appropriate level of liquidity for a startup? In other words, how much cash, as a function of monthly expenses, should you have in the bank? Um, more is better. Uh, the, the, uh, it, that's my simple metric. It, whatever you have, more would be better. Um, uh, but you, you, you. In terms of a of a real base, even in a good condition, it's going to take at least a few months to close any financing round. So if you're less than three months from running out of cash, you really got a problem because it's unusual to close a financing round in less than three months. So uh, I would I would get worried before before my cash balance got to three times my burn rate and I would be lowering my burn rate as, as I got to, to that. I'd feel better with six months than three months and I'd feel better with more months after that but but as the number of months shrinks um, that's where you need to be getting ahead of the curve and already be in discussions about how are you going to raise more money while simultaneously um, lowering your burn rate. Uh, if you need if you have to do a layoff, you have to do a layoff. If you need to not pay yourself or not pay uh, some of your own vendors, um, 
you, you need to lower your burn rate um, before you get in, into a situation where you, you're within a couple of months of, uh, of running out of cash. Okay, we are, we are joined uh, by Miriam Rivera, CEO of Kauffman Fellows Academy, and also a Kauffman Fellow, and involved in many, many startups and investing in many startups. I just uh, want to bring Miriam in, just to, she's been sitting here listening uh, to our conversation, and anything you want to throw at Eric right now to talk about or wrap up some of the things we've been discussing? Um, should talk a little bit about some of the downsides that can come early on uh, for startups in terms of either angel investors or VCs that are investing as angel investors. What do you think are some of the potential downsides for the company in terms of being able to raise a Series A from a, a real VC um, from that first round? Well, I think there there are a lot of potential downfalls, and and, and Miriam, I think you you, you probably uh, know know more about this than I do. Um, but uh, you know, one thing is you you can get VCs. You, you want to set yourself up to not create problems down the road. Um, the 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 a lot the first thing that a lot of entrepreneurs worry about is you know are they going to get uh, diluted too much? Is the VC going to look for you know, uh, too big a share of the company, but it's easy to focus too much on that and ignore um, other problems. Sometimes you'll want a VC who wants a bigger share if they're going to bring more to the table and if the other elements of the term sheet are cleaner. You're going to want, um, you're going to want to make sure that the the term sheet is not tilted in such a way that us later investors are going to be uh, scared off and and. Uh, you know, going through all of the ways that that, that could happen it's probably take more time than we have. But you know, every, there's a balance that every VC or angel needs to strike between protecting their own interests and and not protecting their own interest at the expense of later investors so much that you will have trouble getting later investors. Um, and so you really need to think about uh, getting your bylaws straight from the start. Um, getting things like the liquidity preferences and and uh, and, and the waterfall uh, on how that initial investor gets paid um, fair for that investor, but also not punitive to later investors um, from the start. And the best thing you can do is try to get more than one term sheet. Uh, you, you know, I think there was a line in the, in the startup CEO one of the lectures that said. You know, the, the best day in a startup's life is that first term sheet, and the next best day is the second competing term sheet. Um, because uh, you'll find that, that some, some of these folks who want to insist on some clauses may back off when you say, hey, I've got a term sheet from this guy down the street, and, and they don't have that clause. Um, that's your best argument for getting rid of the clause, not just, I don't like this clause. Um, and, and Miriam, I'd ask you, uh, you know, with your experience in funding startups, what 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 are what are some of the uh, war stories that you might have seen with uh, with startups uh, and, and their initial investor? Well, one of the things that I see on a fairly regular basis is that uh, the founder may be more concerned with the valuation at the first round of financing than he is with either the quality of the angels. Um, the quality of involvement and commitment that he's going to get from uh, folks in that round and that you kind of end up trading that high valuation sometimes uh, in a, that high valuation early on can end up being a liability downstream because if you actually don't deliver from that first round anything of value you're probably going to get a lower valuation next time or the reality is that a lot of uh, subsequent investors just won't even bother to deal with the mess that you might have with your investors in terms of cramming them down and trying to get them to accept a lower percentage of ownership in the company so that they can still have um, the percentage ownership that they're looking for. So you can really uh, hobble yourself in terms of being overly committed to that high valuation and not committed enough to active involvement. And that can especially happen with now we're seeing a lot of rounds where VCs are acting as angels, but they're not taking any um, any active role in the companies. They're really doing it as an option value um, to see whether or not this company just ends up being one of those that takes off uh, 
kind of like a la Facebook. And if it is, they're happy to invest in subsequent rounds. But if there isn't, they're much more likely to say, you know, we're just going to uh, cut and cut and run now. And you just really have financing risk downstream in terms of being able to get um, more financing because you've got a bunch of people basically saying, well, now our firm is not interested in investing in subsequent rounds. I uh, know. I think you raised some really good points, particularly around the valuation. It's the valuation at the end that matters, not the valuation that somebody says you're worth at the beginning. And you need to avoid going for that ego validation that, oh, somebody thinks I'm worth a lot. Uh, and instead, you know, not set yourself up for problems later. And if you get too optimistic early on, you increase the odds that you might have a down round later where you lose your momentum and, and, uh, and, and nobody wants that. I, I do want to just take one last question uh, from one of the students and then we're, we are going to have to wrap up, but from Irina Men, if, if you're bootstrapping and you, you know, some, you're going to take a straight infusion of capital into the company, what are the risks with it? If you're, if you're doing well bootstrapping already, uh, should you take that infusion of capital and run with it or should you just stick with your bootstrapping efforts? Well, I, I think it depends on the circumstance, and I, I, I would uh, defer to Miriam uh, to, to hear her answer as well. But what I would offer is that it, it depends on what you're going to do with the money. Um, and if, if you're in a position, if you get the, uh, the new equity infusion, that you can really scale up faster, you can get ahead of your competition, and, and you, can, you, you can really take the business to a new level, then... And, and, uh, and the VC is offering expertise, they're reasonable, the valuation makes sense, and they're not overly diluting your equity stake, then there's nothing, there's no reason, you shouldn't say, I'm going to reject this infusion because I'm bootstrapped and I could survive continuing to be bootstrapped. The question is, can you do better with, with the infusion of, of equity capital? And the answer is often going to be yes, um, you still have the ability to boot, to continue to bootstrap, but uh, for many early stage companies, you can't have too much capital, um, and and so you you it, the question is what will this capital allow you to do for yourself? If you're just going to put it in the bank and have more of a safety cushion, it may not be worth it. But if you can deploy it in a productive way, it, it very well could be worth it. I, let's, I, you know, we are really running out of time, but I do want. There's another one I, I did want to uh, go with uh, from Irina, and maybe to both, so you both could answer this because it is a tough thing as a startup. You know, how do you establish that valuation? I mean, uh, when you when you're a startup and you're going, uh, you're going out to, to try to raise money. How do you how do you establish your valuation? You want to, Miriam, maybe answer first. So uh, one, uh, I think Eric uh, alluded to this earlier. If you have two term sheets, you're having more market information about what the valuation of your company is because in the early stages, a lot of it is what are people willing to pay. Um, the other uh, thing that I try to have people do is try to find parallels in. Uh, that have already either been funded or been successful at exits and that can help you to um, potentially have a valuation set for your industry. Another one is um, the some of the major law firms here in Silicon Valley will do these quarterly analysis of what's happened in venture deals and what the valuations were that were given for different types of companies like software versus uh, biotech, let's say. And so you have some actual data that's been compiled from uh, venture reports because uh, every every uh, financing has to have uh, filing with the state of California and the law firms look at that to be able to get the valuation numbers and to be able to give some advice. Eric, do you have any suggestions? Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think valuation is pretty subjective in an early stage. I mean, ultimately, valuation is what somebody will pay you. Um, and and if, nobody, if nobody's offering to pay you for your business yet, then it's then it becomes a fairly subjective guess. Um, and you can apply multiples from other companies in your space. You can do a discounted uh, cash flow analysis where you, you, you try your best to uh, project the growth in revenues and, and in profits. You know, the, the problem with discounted cash flow, it's the most accurate way to do it, but it's the most sensitive. Very small changes in assumption can yield very large changes in the implied valuation. 
Um, so ultimately, you 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 do it a few different ways. You do a discounted cash flow. You look at multiples. You see what uh, different investors how they're valuing it, and and you 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 try to do something that doesn't look like an outlier relative to those multiple methods of having done the valuation. But but I I would just caution against getting too hung up on the valuation because back to what we said earlier, the valuation the number that you assign to it now doesn't matter as much as as the valuation you're going to have uh, a couple of years from now when you're when you're hoping to uh, to go public or be acquired or just you know be a bigger private company it, it, it's the future valuation that matters not not what number you're guessing at today okay this really is the last question from David Kasem he wants to clarify when you stated having three to six months of cash on hand you mentioned the burn are you saying you should have three months of the difference of net revenue and expense or three months of total expense, i.e. payroll and everything? Well, uh, more is always better, but uh, I was thinking in terms of, uh, of the, 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 the burn rate. It, I guess it depends on whether, whether that revenue is, is you can count on it being sustainable. Was this a customer that you got that, that, that is happy and you say, okay, the odds that they continue to to pay for this are good, or was this a one-off that may or may not be repeated? Um, and so there is some judgment in there, and and it's a good question, and you could you could go either way. If you want to be conservative, I would say let's start with, let you know, let's start with just looking at the expense because let's assume at a first cut that all the revenue is at risk. What what if your product messes up, and you temporarily lose all revenue? That that could happen. I mean that's that's the sort of worst case you're planning for and if it takes a few months to do a financing round and you're and you only have a couple months worth of expenses on hand you have a problem um, so I would conservatively start with a multiple of your expense and then and then I would uh, adjust it if you think that you have revenue that's sticky and and that you are you know you already have somebody happy who's paying you and it's likely to keep paying you Okay, Miriam, I think she also has an answer to. Yeah, so one of the things that I see with companies um, is having uh, different kinds of projections for um, you know the day when they are going to run out of cash, and that's what they call zero day. So, um, the more experienced the entrepreneur, the more they're thinking about this zero day. When are they going to run out of cash? And they often have um, more than one form of projection that they're using. They're kind of using a scenario-based approach to looking at if things go well, my zero day is this. If things are going poorly, my zero day is that. They're working backward from there, and they are taking into consideration things like um, sometimes who is non-essential in the company that um, if things are going really bad I will um, cut uh, what sort of expenses can be cut and which ones can't be cut to make those projections and to figure out um, where they're comfortable with when that zero day is going to happen and the thing I see with more experienced CEOs is that they start getting nervous when there's less than 18 months of cash in the bank and they are already starting to think about okay what can I do with sales what can I do with venture debt what can I do in terms of strategic investments what can I do in terms of fundraising additional capital uh, they're always working with that zero day in mind and realizing that one of their big jobs as CEO is making sure that zero day is as far out as possible great well Eric thank you so much for joining us Miriam as well I did want to say Eric is also an instructor on KFA uh, he co-authored a book with his colleague Joe LaPuma uh, called unlike unlocking the ivory tower how management research can transform your business we do have it as a class on KFA that will be offered in late spring called the mini MBA unlocking the ivory tower so we hope uh, some of you might join us for that and get some of, more of Eric's expertise uh, again, we are having another Google Hangout next week with Matt Bloomberg, of course, the instructor of Startup CEO, and he'll be joined by Brad Feld, a celebrated VC and also author, and he's the one that launched the whole series of the Startup Revolution and, and actually uh, asked Matt Bloomberg to write the book, Startup CEO, so we'll be letting you know about that. Meantime, uh, you will be able to review this broadcast. We'll be getting it out. Uh, anytime you want to look at some of the past broadcasts from the class, it's all in the Startup Corner, the KFA startup corner so once again thanks for joining us and uh, hopefully we'll see you again next week thanks thank you thanks